Fossil fuels provide energy for production and transportation of virtually every product we own or consume. And many of those products are actually made from petroleum. To get an idea of how deeply embedded fossil fuels are in our everyday products, let's take the example of a nylon shirt. Nylon itself is made from crude oil. An enormous amount of energy is used throughout the process of creating the shirt, almost all of it fossil fuel energy. First, the crude oil is extracted from the ground. Then it is shipped to a refinery where it is distilled into chemicals that make nylon. The polymers are shipped to a factory to create the nylon thread. The thread is then shipped overseas where using machinery and labor the shirt is made. Then it is shipped back to North America and trucked to a store. The consumer drives a car to the store, buys the shirt, and drives back home. The shirt is not only made of oil, it's a wash in oil. A similar trail of energy use can be followed for nearly every product we consume. But nowhere are fossil fuels more critical to humanity than in the production of food. Every organism has to get more energy from its food than it expends in getting its food. Like coyote, if it has to spend more energy in running down the rabbit than it can get from eating the rabbit, that's not a good situation. If, it, if this happens habitually over time, the coyote dies. We human beings have been able to get around that constraint through the use of fossil fuels. We use natural gas as a feedstock for chemical fertilizers. We use oil to make uh, chemical pesticides and herbicides. And then we transport foods ever further distances. We're using far more energy than we'll ever get from eating the food. For every calorie of food energy we get, we've invested something like 10 calories of energy in growing the food, transporting it, cooking it, and so on. For any other organism, this would spell extinction. One of the foundational myths of our culture is based on a truth and a lie. The truth is that if you are naked and hungry and outdoors and it's cold and raining, you're unhappy. I think we can all agree on that. And if somebody brings you in and gives you clothing and sets you next to a fire and gives you a big bowl of soup, you go from being unhappy to happy real quickly. basic needs are met. So that's the truth. The lie is that, well, if that amount of stuff will make you that happy, then twice as much stuff will make you twice as happy. Ten times as much stuff will make you ten times as happy. A hundred times as much stuff will make you a hundred. A thousand times as much. A million times as much. And Bill Gates lives in a state of perpetual bliss. That's the lie. It's one of the things that is driving us to destroy this earth and ourselves. Well, there's actually been polling over many decades and, and happiness levels of, of various populations. If you look at the polls today as opposed to the polls in the 1950s, Americans are just about as happy on average as, as they were 50 years ago. And yet consumption levels have tripled during that period. Now, 
That being the case, how is it that we've compelled ourselves into this world in which material growth becomes the primary focus of almost all of our endeavors? And what we find is that in many respects, the power of this myth, again, overrides all the data that suggests we far exceeded the level of consumption required for a sense of personal well-being. There are volumes of letters written by people who were on the Titanic who survived, but they recall having argued with other passengers to get in the lifeboats, get in the lifeboats. And there are a couple of accounts of people holding up the brochure of the star line saying, why should I get in the lifeboat? It says right here that this is an unsinkable ship. And that again is the power of myth. These people would obviously rather believe in the power of the myth than in the necessity to change their way of being and get in the lifeboat. Well, look, we're all looking for lifeboats now, and we should be encouraging each other to get in those lifeboats. Abandon the myth. If we keep behaving this way, the ship will go down. The American way of life, to put it bluntly, is not sustainable. This uh, quote of uh, George I in Rio de Janeiro at the Earth Summit uh, in 1992 was that the American way of life was not open for negotiation at that summit. And at the same time, uh, he was uh, very prominently uh, sort of speeding around in his speedboat off of Maine and that sort of epitomizing the American way of life. I think that that does really represent a big challenge in terms of the U.S. relationship to the rest of the world. The very heavy, you know, disproportionate use of resources in the U.S. is very well known and understood throughout the world, and it's one of the things that the U.S. is resented for. When I hear uh, our leaders tell us that the American way of life is, is non-negotiable, uh, the first response that comes to my mind is, well, uh, yeah, maybe, but you know, beyond a certain point, nature doesn't negotiate. We may want to maintain the American way of life indefinitely into the future, but the fact of the matter is, it's just not in the cards. The world does not have the resource base to enable us to maintain this way of life. And ultimately, that's a good thing. I mean, if, if you could imagine the rest of the world attempting to live as we are uh, indefinitely, the consequence would be the destruction of the biosphere. We roughly consume twice as much of almost everything as the Europeans do. The Europeans, of course, have a standard of living that is very, very close to ours. So that's a very striking difference. Not only do we use the most in the world, we use 25% of the world's oil with 4.5% of the world's population, but, but we're actually expanding our use of oil on a year-on-year -year basis. So the current reality is that the U.S. is profligate, wasting oil, setting a bad example. 